who was elected to replace the outgoing speaker, not simply the wife. The fact that in the statement or the speech you refer to her as the wife, not recognizing her three-year tenure as deputy speaker and therefore the natural successor is, in my view, disrespectful to the highest degree. <laughs> Madam Speaker, women like men are individuals in their own right who ought not to be defined by their relationship with either men or in the case of... Uh, when you do this, you subordinate the professional role of the woman or the man. Wife, mother, sister are roles that women sometimes play, much like men are sometimes husbands, brothers, and fathers. But in a professional setting, it does not sit well with the tradition of respect within our society that has been that for you to refer to any female parliamentary colleague by her marital relationship with her husband. By, by all means, talk about the speaker's decisions, criticize them if you must, but leave the wife alone. It was out of order, Madam Speaker, and the opposition leader can do better. It reminds me of when the member from East Portland, campaigning her in her own right, was derogatorily referred to as the wife of Mr. Vaz. And she won't be anything but the wife of Minister Vaz. There's a, there's a trend. She, of course she's the wife of Minister Vaz. But in the context of the campaign, she was the Jamaica Labour Party candidate for the seat. It would have been better had the opposition leader said the move to replace her with the deputy speaker of the house who happens to be the wife of the prime minister, etc., etc., etc. But completely ignoring her position in this house, yes. Madam Speaker, was absolutely and, and reducing her to only one component, that of wife, was disrespectful, Madam Speaker, and should not be repeated. Madam Speaker, Mrs. The Deputy Speaker acted, as I said, many times as Speaker for three years. And never once, to the best of my knowledge, did any member rise to his or her feet to provide any objection on the account of a marital relationship with the Prime Minister. When the Deputy Speaker was nominated to fill the role of Speaker, her nomination was seconded by none other than the Leader of Opposition Business, the member from East Kingston and Port Royal. Who, Mr. Philip Paulwell, who rose to his feet and said, Madam Speaker, I beg to second the motion. The Speaker was then unanimously elected by both sides of the House with cheers and applause. Madam Speaker, the former leader of the opposition, the member from St. Andrew East Central, no, just for people listening, after people listening don't know East Central, says so Mr. Peter Phillips. A few sittings later, without invitation or solicitation, yes. rose to his feet on his own accord and addressed the speaker directly, looking at her and saying, a major impulse that brought me here today was to see you in your elevated position. Madam Speaker, this was greeted with spontaneous and rapturous applause by both sides of the aisle, including many on that side who applauded that remark. Madam Speaker, the opposition welcomed the promotion of the Deputy Speaker to Speaker and expressed no issues of principle. Madam Speaker, 
principle is principle. Principle is not something that changes with the wind. Principle is not something that changes when circumstances get tough. Principles are principles, Madam Speaker. Principle is not something that changes because you disagree. Principle is not something that changes because of political opportunity. Principle is principle. And given that the leader of the government opposition, of go, op, opposition business, his full throttled endorsement of the Deputy Speaker's elevation, the, the opposition's leader's statement last week, Madam Speaker, publicly undermines and emasculates the member and sends an unmistakable message that we cannot trust what any of, our, of them over there says. Because at any time, the opposition leader is likely at any day, any time, any place to just flip-flop, to contradict and to undermine. No, look, the opposition leader has a disagreement with the speak speaker's position on a specific matter. And I support his right to disagree on a specific matter. But rather than address that matter specifically, he raises an objection in principle to our appointment despite the opposition having supported that principle in the past. That, Madam Speaker, is what you call unprincipled. It is flip-flop and it is not leadership that you can trust. And we find it over and over again, Madam Speaker, even in the same speech, the presentation includes unprincipled positions. Madam Speaker. Having, having met Madam Speaker on another matter last year with a few opposition MPs who shall remain nameless on the principle of the salary reform for parliamentarians, I introduced the changes via statement in this House in May of 2023. The member for, from St. Andrew Southeastern, who is an opposition spokesman of finance, his name is Mr. Julian Robinson, he rose to his feet and he said, in the full view of cameras, publicly, the opposition takes no issue with what the minister has announced. Yeah. Madam Speaker, without the opposition support, and in this house, Madam Speaker, the public support in this house, as demonstrated by the member from St. Andrew Southeastern, that adjustment for parliamentarians would not have happened, which is why I met with a group of them before, and they know that. And it is the failure, Madam Speaker, wait, wait. It is the failure of opposition and governments of the day in the past. There's a member here in this house who is visiting from a previous, previous administration. And he can tell you that is a failure of opposition and government to agree in the past that stymied previous efforts on parliamentary compensation. Although the opposition member with finance responsibility got up and publicly gave support on behalf of the opposition to my statement outlining the details, days later, Madam Speaker, the opposition of the opposition leader, meaning the opposition run by the opposition leader, issues a statement that completely contradicted the support offered by the opposition finance spokesman, undermined him, emasculated him, Madam Speaker, and meant we cannot trust what he says unless Mark is present. Seemingly for political gain. Seemingly for political gain. He emasculates his own colleague who he appointed. That is unprincipled, Madam Speaker. That is flip-flop. And that is not leadership that you can trust. It sends, Madam Speaker, the unmistakable message that we cannot trust. We cannot trust what they say. Now, this is a 
This is a big problem, you know. No, madam speaker. So, madam speaker. Madam speaker. Cannot be trusted. This madam speaker is a problem. It's a problem for Jamaica. And you know why it's a problem for Jamaica? Because government and opposition have to work together. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah? And so the opposition leader contradicting, undermining, and emasculating the very people he has appointed, Madam Speaker, is inimical to constructive working relationship. For example, Madam Speaker, it is customary for the House leader on the government side and the leader of an opposition business on that side to get together and to talk about matters concerning the House and how issues are going to be dealt with. And Madam Speaker, in those conversations, they have to make decisions on the fly. They have to agree on the fly, whether it's behind here or it's on the phone. Madam Speaker, the leader of opposition in the House has been in this House for 30 years, including the Senate. 30 years. We have to be able to rely on his word as opposition, leader of opposition business. But how can we rely on what he says when the opposition leader forces flip-flop, unprincipled behaviour? And he emasculates and undermines his own colleagues, Madam Speaker. Thus, it may not be good for their party, but it's certainly not good for Jamaica. And the member from St. Andrew Southeastern, who has, put for, has responsibility to the shadow. He's an opposition sportsman on finance. How can we rely on his word when he's publicly ridiculed, emasculated, and undermined in that way? That is not leadership, Madam Speaker, that anyone can trust. Madam Speaker, the opposition leader can publicly emasculate Philip and Julian. They may not have people to speak up for them, but let me tell you this. Don't touch Juliet. <laughs> Madam Speaker, under this government, even, even after the worst economic crisis in our history, Jamaica's macroeconomic fundamentals are the strongest they've been for 50 years. And we are leveraging, leveraging that economic stability in the people's interest. We are entrenching fiscal responsibility by strengthening fiscal rules and birthing a new institution, the Fiscal Commission, to increase the incentives for fiscal sustainability and magnify the disincentives for pursuing a path of fiscal recklessness. We Jamaicans have paid a heavy price for the absence of fiscal responsibility, Madam Speaker. And it is my fervent hope that fiscal responsibility will become not only rooted in institutionally, but will be firmly anchored in hearts and minds. No, Madam Speaker, the opposition leader advances a narrative of rescuing Jamaica in the 2012 to 2016 period to suggest that fiscal responsibility started then. Madam Speaker, I have a lot of respect for, the, for former Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller, for her work, for her achievements, and for Peter Phillips, the finance minister in her administration. But I do not believe that that justifies a distortion of the facts. It was Prime Minister Bruce Golding and Audley Shaw who had the audacity and the courage to point out that the economic policies of the 1989 to 2007 administration were unsustainable and reckless. Madam Speaker, for periods during that 18-year stretch, just two expenditure items, interest and salaries, exceeded tax revenues. Just imagine that. 
No, no garbage truck, no bus, no truck, no asphalt, no police car, no uniform, no, nothing for the path people, path uh, persons on path, nothing for pensions, just interest and wages alone exceeded tax revenues. The, that administration, Madam Speaker, put up a chart with the deficits, ran large deficits for 11 consecutive years between 1996-97 and 2006-07. The charts showing the deficits will soon come up. Very large deficits. Madam Speaker, if you look at the deficits here. These are the deficits between 1996-97 and 2006-07. Deficits 5, 6% year after year after year. These deficits became unsustainable, and it should not be surprising that it was during this period that represented one of the fastest rises in Jamaica's debt, a five-fold increase in our debt, or 500%, Madam Speaker, in this 11-year period. From 184 billion, Madam Speaker, in March 1996 to 923 billion dollars in March 2007. The, the 1989 to 2007 administration. And if you start earlier, there was a nine-fold increase, 950% increase in Jamaica's debt from March of 1992 to March of 2007. 950%, Madam Speaker. From about 90-something billion to 923 billion. So just, this is the this Madam Speaker is the ferocious, torrential, and unsustainable fiscal current that the Bruce Golding administration stepped into. Okay, you have a you have a current that is blowing fast. The the pace at which the debt is increasing is 500 percent in 11 years. That is what they stepped into, and they had the courage, Madam Speaker to call this out as unsustainable. Yeah. It was during the period of unsustainable deficits, Madam Speaker, that the prevailing wisdom was ta-ta. That is a disengagement from the IMF and the World Bank and their cheap financing along with their sustainable policy prescriptions in favor of expensive financing from capital markets. It was Bruce Golding and Audley Shaw who saw that ta-ta and 500% increases in debt over 11 years was destroying Jamaica. And they led the process to re-engage, Madam Speaker, with the IMF and the World Bank. The era of fiscal responsibility started with them. You'll see. You'll see. Madam Speaker, it was in the Golding administration that the government which lost one billion US dollars in Air Jamaica was sold, releasing the Jamaican people from this major source of debt escalation. It was during this period the sugar company of Jamaica was sold, releasing another major contributor to debt escalation. It was in this period that the Financial Audit and Administration Act was significantly amended as part of a broader financial reform effort. And these, effort, these reforms were made, aimed at improving fiscal responsibility. It was during this period that fiscal rules were introduced to Jamaica for the first time, Madam Speaker. There was fiscal disrule before then. For the first time, Madam Speaker, the tax expenditure statement was submitted to Parliament and has since become an annual practice and now a legislative requirement. They implemented the first debt exchange to address unsustainability of debt. Now, faced with what was then the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, the fiscal accounts worsened. Yeah? But the pace of debt accumulation slowed considerably. From an approximate 1,000% increase in debt over the PNP administration, the debt grew by approximately 70% over four years. So we went from a pace of 1,000% over 18 years and 500% over 11 years. You can do the math. 500 divided by 11, okay? To one where the debt moved now by 70% over four years. 
Okay? So when you with this torrential, torrential cascading of fiscal unsustainability, not something that just stops overnight. What you have to do first is to slow the pace of that accumulation. And they achieve that from a five from a 1,000% over 18 years, 500% over 11 years, and then 70% over four years. Yeah? So the, def we're not, the deficits continued under them. They continue. And during the, the worst part of the crisis, the deficit, deficit got really large. But the debt accumulation slowed. So you look at this chart, Madam Speaker, and you look at debt accumulation across different periods. You'll see from April 1992 to March 2008, and I use the end of the fiscal year, even though governments change in between. There was a 952% increase in the debt accumulation during that period of time. That is unmistakable fact. Nothing they say can change that. Nothing. Nothing. And, then, Nothing. and then you look at the next period, Madam Speaker, which is the period April 2008 to March 2012. The debt accumulation dropped from 952% to 66%, yeah? And then under the Portia Simpson administration, it dropped even further to 24%. And then under us, it has dropped even further to 6%, Madam Speaker, over seven years. I, I, I remember that very well. All right, so if you look at this graph, you ask, when did fiscal responsibility begin? When did we begin to get a hold of the runaway debt situation that we had in Jamaica, it's unmistakable, unmistakable. We have been fed a narrative, Madam Speaker, that is misleading. Of course the program failed. It failed, absolutely it did. It failed. However, Madam Speaker, it didn't fail because fiscal responsibility was absent. It failed, Madam Speaker, because there wasn't the social consensus in the society for fiscal responsibility. Members, the minister's time for speaking has expired. House Leader. Madam Speaker, the member's time having been expired, I beg to move that the speaker's time be extended sufficiently to allow him to complete his presentation. May it please you. The question is that the, so, the, question is that the minister be allowed the question is that the minister be allowed sufficient time to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Minister? Yes, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, Member of the House. So we've been fed this narrative, Madam Speaker, which is based on a fact that the IMF agreement did collapse. But it did not collapse because the government what didn't have fiscal responsibility. Yeah. It collapsed because fiscal responsibility, there was not a social consensus in the society at that point about the need for fiscal responsibility. And as a result, we, unions, <laughs> the agreements that the unions were prepared to accept, breached the terms of the agreement. But it's unmistakable that by switching from the fiscal policy of the prior period, 1989 all the way to 2007, and engaging the multilaterals, Jamaica was able to slow down immensely the accumulation of debt, Madam Speaker. And that is the true measurement, ultimately, of fiscal responsibility. Now, my position, Madam Speaker, is that it's not that there was not a difference between 2007 and 11 and 2012 and 2016. I'm not saying that it wasn't a difference. But what I'm saying is the difference was not around the policy of fiscal responsibility of government. Madam Speaker, the difference is that the social conditions were entirely different, and they were entirely different in large part Madam Speaker, because Prime Minister Holness had the honesty and the courage in 2011 to tell Jamaicans the truth about the need for fiscal discipline. I was there, I was with him. I visited the IMF with him in October of 2011. 
and he came back determined to tell the Jamaican people the truth. And he went, it may not have been the most politically elegant way of expressing it, but it was the truth. And, and so what you had happening, Madam Speaker, is that an outgoing government had lost on the platform of promising fiscal discipline and an incoming government that had no choice but to implement it. And Jamaica never had a better chance. No, it's fact. Fact. My Speaker, to the credit of the 2012 to 2016 administration, they made use of that chance. But to this day, I cannot understand that if fiscal responsibility is your thing, and it's been such a great achievement, why campaign on someone's house? If you embrace it and believe it, why didn't you speak it? Eh? Madam Speaker, they did not speak it because fiscal responsibility is not core to who they are. Madam Speaker, the facts are that in the 2012 to 2016 period, the administration found itself in a position where there were no other options. The time, time came for Tata. Time came for Run With It. And they found themselves in a deeply intrusive extended fund facility arrangement from 2013 onwards, where they had to do as they were told. So yes, the IMF is fiscally responsible, responsible, and individuals in that cabinet may have a claim to being fiscally responsible, Madam Speaker, but the PNP cannot claim to be fiscally responsible, as history will show that the PNP government has never been fiscally responsible when they have a choice. Madam Speaker, examine the record, examine the record from 1972 to 1980, and examine the record from 1989 to 2007, when they had choice. Fiscal responsibility is not determined by when you have no choice and your hands are tied. Implementing fiscal responsi responsible policies when you have no choice in the matter and your hands are tied is not a demonstration of fiscal responsibility. Jamaica ran out of options, and they were under the watchful eye of the IMF, thank God, and individuals did good work during that time, but there was no choice in the matter. Under this government, we have had choice. We graduated from an IMF program in 2019. We went through COVID on our own steam with homegrown policies, homegrown ideas. We displayed fiscal responsibility before the crisis, during the crisis, after the crisis, leading Jamaica to one of the fastest, most complete recoveries in the Western Hemisphere. We piloted Jamaica through the worst economic storms in our history, Madam Speaker, on our own. That is fiscal responsibility. You demonstrate fiscal responsibility when you have choice, when you have lots of choice, and you still decide to do the responsible thing. So don't come here and tell anyone about fiscal responsibility when your party has never exhibited it, when it had the privilege of choice. The only thing you can point to is when you were locked into a vice made by 18 years of fiscal recklessness and you had no choice whatsoever, and thank God you had to implement. And, Madam Speaker, I want you to understand what I, the, the, my argument. Um, nothing takes away from the individual effort and achievement during that period. There was remarkable individual effort. I am saying that institutionally, the party that formed the government, Madam Speaker, has not to, this not to date, during a period that they were in government, and they had choice demonstrated with that choice fiscal responsibility. That is undeniable and incontrovertible. We demonstrate fiscal responsibility of our own free will, and we're not afraid to talk to people about it. 
It requires a commitment to principle, which does not change when the sun is out or when it rains. Principle is principle. With that kind of leadership, Madam Speaker, that they have demonstrated, emasculation of senior people and flip-flops and U-turns, you cannot trust them because when it gets difficult and the pressure mounts and the NEC starts to bark, they will turn on any principle. Even today, Madam Speaker, we have funding from the Resilience and Sustainability Fund of the IMF. But due to the performance of Jamaica, we have policy freedom and we still choose to be fiscally responsible. Now, Madam Speaker, while I'm on this point, I want to just clear up a piece of misinformation that's often in the public domain. When the opposition, then opposition leader, Portia Simpson Miller, famously told Jamaica that she'd have concluded an IMF agreement in two weeks, well, we know it took 40 times as long. Yeah. Now, Madam Speaker, at the end of the Golding, Bruce Golding administration, Jamaica had two billion US dollars in foreign exchange reserves. But they took a, they, it took time to conclude a follow-up agreement with the fund. And by November 2013, Jamaica's foreign exchange reserves had dwindled to 835 million US dollars. They like to misremember this. And if you look at their, what they tweet and so on, they believe that administration started with 835 million US dollars. Not Nagoso at all. That the Porsche Simpson administration started with 2 billion US dollars in net international reserves, and they ended with 2.2 billion dollars in net international reserves. And approximately 1 billion of it, or a half, was represented by borrowed reserves or certificates of deposits or CDs. Madam Speaker, we took the baton with $2.2 billion of reserves and now there are $4.7 billion of reserves. And CDs have been reduced dramatically to only $85 million. That's all? Out of the 4.7. Madam Speaker, there was a time that the three words, the, my, the screens, let's, there was a time, Madam Speaker, that the three words, the three words that would confuse the opposition were Jamaica Labour Party. <laughs> Madam Speaker, over the last seven years, something else that now confuses the opposition, Madam Speaker, is no new taxes. If you don't believe me, look at their faces when I say it again. No new taxes for seven consecutive years. Madam Speaker, it it makes them delirious because, because of Jamaica's economic history, they know the potency of that. So it makes them talk all kinds of things, things that are not true and things sometimes that don't make any sense. Exactly. Madam Speaker, I want you to pay attention to me in particular here. The opposition leader in his presentation puts up a chart, Madam Speaker, yes. that purports to show revenue growth over the period of this government. Did you hear that? Revenue growth. This is the chart he puts up. And I have, Madam Speaker, I don't know any other way to say it other than I have not seen a more deceptive chart in this house than this. Madam Speaker, he shows 2015-16. He does not show 2016-17. He does not show 2017-18. He does not show 2018-19. Nor 2019-20. And he certainly does not show 2020-21.
Wait, 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 no, wait, no, man. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Man, speaker. When was COVID again? When was COVID? What year? Eh? 2020? So he's showing a chart of revenues of this administration that deliberately leaves out the COVID year and the years after? And then he shows 21, 22, 22, 23, and 23, 24 projections, Madam Speaker. It's like he's playing peekaboo. Peekaboo. That's a chart there. In short 2015, 16, leave out all of the other years and in plain peekaboo. 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 The first question, Madam Speaker, is why would he do this? Why would he do it? Why would he hide the period 2016 17 to 2020 21? Uh, why would he do that? Deception. Why would he do that? Red card, Madam Speaker, for him. Red card. He then says, Madam Speaker, that revenues have doubled, Madam Speaker, and that I would say over nine years, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that the point that revenue is going up in an environment of no new taxes? Madam Speaker, there is no PNP government that has presided over Jamaica with a nine year stretch of continuously increasing tax revenues in real terms without the imposition of any new taxes. They're simply confused and their confusion present charts that skip over years and are therefore deceptive, Madam Speaker. The average annual rate of, I'm going to show you, the average annual rate of increases in tax revenues over the entire period, Madam Speaker, is 9.4% per annum. That's the compounded annual increase in tax revenues over the period project budgeted for 24 25 going all the way back to actual 2015 2016 yeah what happened madam speaker and what the opposition leader this in my view i think is deceptively excludes is disingenuous yes. he he excludes the covid contraction in revenues madam speaker and in the, the revenues declined by 13 percent or uh 73 billion dollars and the recovery, Madam Speaker, the recovery from that low, no, go back to the chart, please. The recovery from that low, Madam Speaker, has been accelerated as compared to the trend. So when you look at the revenue, in, revenue growth the year after COVID versus the COVID year, it went up by 22%. Yeah. But in that year, when you compare it to the year before COVID, it was just 6%. But he shows the 22%, doesn't show the decline, and makes a meal of it, thinking that nobody is going to find him out. Red card, Madam Speaker. Red card. So let's go back to the table as it should have been. We're not, we're not afraid to hide anything. Show the whole thing. Don't cover it up playing peekaboo. That is what it looks like, Madam Speaker. And what you'll see is that in the last year of their administration, Tax revenues went up by 11 percent, and in 16, 17, it went up by 11 percent for us too, and then 8 percent a year after, and 9 percent a year after, and 7 percent a year after, and then it declined by double digits. So when there was recovery to get back up to where you were, of course there is going to be an accelerated growth, Madam Speaker. He shows the accelerated growth alone, as if to suggest that that characterizes the entire period. Madam Speaker, that is nothing short of utter deception. And to comp and, and Madam Speaker, to compound that deception, Madam Speaker, move to the next chart if you can, please. What he does, he adds up those four years and he says, his verbatim quote, over the four years, 
fiscal year 21 to 22 through to fiscal year 24 25 tax collections have increased by 419 billion 419 billion of additional taxes has been collected from the jamaican people over the last four years i see this is just bare face misleading there and, and just disingenuous first of all there aren't additional taxes there are additional tax revenues and the deception, Madam Speaker, is that he is counting from the depth of COVID when revenues decline by $73 billion in one year. So if you look at the column, the third column from the left, that has uh, prior, uh, it's a dollar increase over prior year. And you look at the four rows in blue, 110 billion, 136, 103, 68. He adds those up and says 400 billion of tax increases in the last four years. Now, what does 110 relate to? 110 is the increase from the COVID year when revenues sank from 579 billion to 505 billion, an increase of 110. So, Madam Speaker, what we experienced, what we experienced is a recovery, Madam Speaker, that was above the mean rate, but the average rate of growth over the nine-year period, Madam Speaker, is 9%. Now, thank God our revenues recovered. Thank God, or else we could not have allocated $200 billion to public sector compensation. We could not be doing the Spark program. We could not be buying 100 JTC buses. We could not be doing 50 garbage trucks. We could not be giving income tax breaks. We could not be raising the pension exemption or the age exemption. We could not be implementing a reverse income tax credit, Madam Speaker. We could not do any of those things without revenue. Madam Speaker, gaslighting is an insidious form of manipulation. Yes. Victims of gaslighting are deliberately and systematically fed false or incomplete information that leads them to question what they know to be true. They may end up doubting their memory, their perception, or even their sanity. My Speaker, the commentary on a table that omits, that starts to talk about revenues for the, under this government, and omits critical information of COVID and the years before, Madam Speaker, is, represents gaslighting by misleading the public into thinking there's something going on with over-the-top revenue, when in fact it is good news. It is entirely explainable and he needs to omit relevant information to present a distorted picture. Madam Speaker, the opposition leader advances the false argument that revenue increases are a result of indirect taxation. Clearly he is forgetting that it is this administration that reduced GCT by 1.5 percentage points. Revenue increases, Madam Speaker, are a result of increased economic activity. Yeah. Them just winging it, Madam Speaker. Them not understand. Jamaica's fiscal data is publicly available. Madam Speaker, when you look at the growth in personal income tax, when you look at the growth in personal income tax revenue, Though we raise the threshold substantially to 1.5 million, income tax revenue has grown from $190 billion in 2015 16. Sorry, grown by a total of $190 billion, or 145% cumulatively, or a compounded annual rate of 10.5%, Madam Speaker. You hear what I just said? Income tax revenue has grown over that period by $190 billion. Faster than the average growth rate of revenues. It has outpaced revenue growth. In addition, Madam Speaker, or not in addition, just reminding that revenues have increased substantially as unemployment declined from 13% to 4%. And we had, under this administration, 30 quarters of economic growth. Broken by COVID, yeah, but you add up the two periods, 20 and 30 quarters of economic growth. Man, if it's not occurred to you 
There is no administration in 50 years that has presided over collectively 30 quarters of economic growth, Madam Speaker. Now, what do you think happens in such an environment? Income tax revenues increase. There, as at 2022, there were 200,000 more cars on the road compared to 2016. Education tax revenue similarly increased by 152% over the period, or $32 billion for a compounded annual increase of 10.8% per annum, outpacing overall revenue growth. Madam Speaker, under our Minister of Tourism, travel tax is up. It's up by 236% over that period. There's an average annual compounded growth of 14.4% and represents $24 billion more in revenue than in 2015-16. And one that nobody has been paying attention to is that tax revenue from betting, gaming, and lotteries has increased by 313% over the same period, Madam Speaker. Our average annual compounded rate of 17%, delivering almost $9 billion more into government coffers than in 2015-16. So, Madam Speaker, when you add those four line items of revenue alone, income tax, education tax, travel tax, they account for $255 billion, or more than 50% of the revenue growth experience. And the growth in those items exceeds the growth in GCT and special consumption tax. In fact, GCT and special consumption tax grew at slower, con slower compounded annual rates of growth. And in the case of special consumption tax, it grew at a rate that is slower than the average growth. So they just have it in their brain, but they don't bother to do the analysis. Don't bother to look at the data. They just talk from the hip. And because he's a big man in society, Tapanar is in believe, so we're going to accept him. Red card for that attitude. Red card for that attitude. Then give me the red, red card. Red card. Red card. Red card. Red card. Red card. Right? Coming up here and expect that because of Mr. Panaris, we're going to believe what I'm saying. See the table there? See the data there? Everybody can see it for themselves. Madam Speaker, the opposition leader ludicrously and misleadingly states that tax revenue of the population increased, well, from 190,000 per person to 340,000 per person. Madam Speaker, since this government came to office, hear me out on this. Hear me on this. Hear me out talking that tax revenue per person has gone from 190,000 to, 190, to 340,000. Him now, watch what we're going on now. Him just a wing it. Madam Speaker, under this government, since this government came to office, the economy has doubled in size. And it's on that chart from $1.688 trillion to $3.289 trillion. Now, if there's no new tax and the economy double, then tax revenue must double too? Who is he really trying to fool? This aspect of his presentation shows contempt, Madam Speaker, for the Jamaican people with these deceptive claims advanced by leaving information out. Under this government, the average economic output of every Jamaican has nearly doubled from approximately $614,936 to $1,198,470, Madam Speaker, by March of 2025. So again I say, even with no new, tax, new taxes, tax revenues per person doubles along with the doubling of economic output per person. Now, Madam Speaker.
Let me just talk about tax revenues as a percentage of GDP. Let me begin this section, Madam Speaker, by just a definition of tax expenditure. One Ta tax expenditures, Madam Speaker, are defined in our tax expenditure statements as any revenue loss that occurs as a result of specific provisions that lead to a reduction in tax payable by a specific tax type, taxpayer activity. The Tax Policy Center defines tax expenditures as special provisions of the tax code, such as exclusions, deductions, deferrals, and credits that benefit specific activities or groups of taxpayers. All right? So tax expenditures are legitimate, but they are expenditures in that they reduce tax revenue. The opposition leader's presentation included the fact that tax revenues as a percentage of GDP moved from 24% in 2015-16 and is projected to be 28% by 2024-25. And tax expenditures are pertinent to the explanation of this observation. So every year, Madam Speaker, since 2011, I'd like to deny that anything happened. Since 2011, the government publishes a tax expenditure statement. And it's, not, it's a very hard document to understand. Yeah, so it does not necessarily kind of see the light of day, a tax expenditure statement. And the explanations for this observation are threefold. And I'll just deal with the first two in this presentation. The first is that tax compliance has increased, which is great, meaning that we collect more of what is on the books. The second reason, Madam Speaker, is that tax exemptions have largely been codified and put into law. There's increased transparency and predictability about tax exemptions. And in terms of tax exemptions, everyone knows what they can get and what they cannot. Madam Speaker, we have been very judicious with tax expenditures. Tax waivers over the past nine years have been limited to no more than 10 million per month. And long may this continue. As such, Madam Speaker, tax expenditures which would normally reduce tax revenues do not have as ample an opportunity as would have existed in the past. Now, I have a chart on the tax expenditures for you to understand what I'm saying. This here, Madam Speaker, is the tax expenditures of Jamaica from 2008 to 2022. 2023 is not yet available. The year is not complete. And what you'll see is that in the past, tax expenditures as a percentage of GDP were 4%, 5%, 6%. That just represents, and in 2013, it peaked at 8%. That represents revenue that's on the books, but that we give away through deductions and exemptions and credits and waivers. Okay? And a big part of our reform has been to codify these as much as is possible and to reduce them. Yeah. And as far as discretionary tax waivers are concerned, we have had a policy uh, of no more than 10 million per month over the past nine years. I believe that discretionary tax waivers were similarly limited under the EFF program. So, Madam Speaker, what happened is that tax expenditures, if you were to compare the period that was put in the chart, decreased from 3.9% to 2.47% over the period 2015 to 2022. And when you add those back and you look at tax revenue before tax expenditures, what you find is that the variation, Madam Speaker, uh, is not what it seems to be. It's much more stable. What explains the differential is, Madam Speaker, that we are allowing far fewer tax expenditures today than were allowed in the past. So when you adjust for tax expenditures, you realize that tax revenue before tax expenditures was 28.3% in 2015-16. Yeah? 21, 22, 28.9%. 22, 23, 29.8. There is still a movement, but not a movement as significant as, uh, as would exist if we did not show the tax expenditures, Madam Speaker. Yes, so I'm adding, but the tax expenditure statement is also submitted this one I'm not claiming that you're deceiving. This one you picked up, I'm not claiming that. This one, we have tax expenditure statements, Madam Speaker, and the tax expenditure statements show, Madam Speaker, 
that when you look at our tax revenues as a proportion of GDP before tax expenditures, it is much more even. What is happening is that the government, more of the revenue that's on the books is coming to the government and we are not giving away. And who benefits from tax? Well, a lot, yeah, it's usually you know, businesses. Right? So this is in the interest of the people that tax expenditures have been declining over time. And, and I, I hope that that can continue, even though you, know, you do something like how many coal tax expenditures are going to go up. Yeah? But again, we will totally be transparent on that when that time comes. Madam Speaker, in May 2023, the Leader of the Opposition declared that Jamaica's income tax threshold should be increased by 40% to 2.1 million. No numbers, no analysis, no costing. Four months later, in September 2023, four months later, he changes his mind, flip-flop again, calling instead for a 100% increase in the income tax threshold. Again, no numbers, no analysis, no costing. Them just a wing it, Madam Speaker, unprincipled positions, shifting in the wind, flip-flop, flip-flop. The whole country waited to hear how Mr. Golding would finance this. Commentators were public with their expectation that Mr. Golding would outline how he would finance the doubling of the threshold. Headlines of the, of the newspapers and the media houses, commentators, government, Golding must, Golding must outline three million income tax threshold plan in budget presentation. And commentators specifically who are named and I won't name here called for that. High expectations for Golding's speech. Why? Because everybody will to hear how he proposed to finance it. And then even the junior spokesperson on finance, Madam Speaker, came on radio and said that the leader of the opposition would outline his funding proposal in the contribution to the budget debate. So again, he has made one of his own lose credibility. But who's going to believe him again? <laughs> Madam Speaker, that is what happens when you have an opposition that makes a habit of unprincipled positions. The expectations of them will always lead to disappointment. Because, Madam Speaker, when I explain that this move would cost nearly 40, uh, over $45 billion, all you could hear was silence. Mouth zip. Not a peep. The opposition leader spoke for two hours and not one word about how he would fund an increase in the income tax threshold that cost over $45 billion. It seems to be the case, Madam Speaker, it seemed to me and to a reasonable person that this was a, a cynical ploy to get the attention of Jamaicans without any idea about how to sustain or finance it. They did not even know the cost. And, you, and I'll tell you in a minute. Thank, I'm sorry. Um, Madam Speaker, the member is trying to mislead the House about the motive of uh, the leader of opposition. And he has no such authority. Minister, it would appear, Minister, Minister, it would appear you may continue. Just for the record, Madam Speaker, I said it seems to be the case. Okay? They don't even know the cost. Just winging it. Unprincipled, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, they cannot be trusted, Madam Speaker. Red card. Red card. Madam Speaker, we propose to increase the income tax threshold to $1.7 million from $1.5 million, which will, which will deliver 50,000 more per year 
to Jamaicans who earn more than $1.5 million. We also introduced for the very first time a reverse income tax credit. Madam Speaker, the Ministry paper tabled included that this is designed to increase compliance. Undoubtedly, the government providing a cash give back to registered taxpayers will incentivize greater formula formalization over the medium term. However, that is not the only aim and certainly not the primary intention of the reverse income tax credit. As such, Madam Speaker, there is nothing in my speech about compliance or about increasing compliance. The words in my speech make it abundantly clear that the intention of the government is that the reverse income tax credit is a fiscal response to prevailing social and economic conditions, particularly for those on the lower end of the income threshold. Madam Speaker, in an income tax system, the taxpayer pays money to the state, and we make such a system progressive by having rates of income tax that increase with income and by establishing an income tax threshold below which no tax is paid at all. Madam Speaker, negative income tax is even more progressive by reversing the direction in which tax is paid for incomes below a certain level. Earners above that level pay money to the state, while earners below receive money from the state. Now, the reverse income tax credit is not negative income tax, but it is designed in that spirit as a one-off measure. We have set the threshold at $3 million because we wanted persons who are just above the current income tax threshold to also benefit. However, Madam Speaker, so those between 1.5 and 3 million, rather than just getting a 50,000 uplift this year, they'll get the 50,000 plus the 20,000, which is a 70,000 uplift for the year. However, Madam Speaker, the reverse income tax credit is targeted at those within the income bracket for 2023 for whom statutory contributions are deducted or who pay statutory deductions themselves. It is only fair, Madam Speaker, that a benefit such as this goes to those who are contributing to the system from monthly deductions that are made, from monthly deductions or other kinds of deductions, or if they pay it themselves. This is fair because they are at a financial disadvantage as compared to those who are not contributing and take home less than those who are outside the system who are earning similar amounts. Yes, it is true that some people are not formalized due to no fault of their own. Their employers neither deduct nor pay over statutory deductions. Well, those persons have a higher net income than others who perform similar functions from whom deductions are made. That is, for most of these persons, by not having statutory contributions deducted, they're better off by more than the value of the reverse income tax threshold, given the aggregate consolidated percentage represented by statutory deductions. So, Madam Speaker, the primary beneficiaries will be those who earn below the income tax threshold, and in particular, Jamaicans earning close to minimum wage who are contributing to the Jamaican system through statutory deductions from their paycheck. Madam Speaker, there are approximately 570,000 Jamaicans already who earn less than $3 million in 2023 and who contributed to the system through deductions of education tax, NHT, and NIS. These are the persons who will qualify for the reverse income tax credit, and anyone else regularized before the end of the fiscal year. And there are 450,000 approximately persons who earn less than 1.5 million who contribute to the system through a deduction of education tax, NHT, and NIS. Madam Speaker, this includes many security guards, room attendants, factory floor workers, machine operators, cooks, waitresses in restaurants, office attendants, messengers, janitors, drivers, sanitation workers, street cleaners, maintenance staff, who toil every day, who contribute to the Jamaican system through statutory deductions. Madam Speaker, the reverse income tax credit is intended for the mass of working people who make this country work and contribute to the Jamaican system through monthly or regular statutory deductions. We are leveraging economic stability to their benefit. Now, Madam Speaker, I heard the opposition leader cynically suggest that the $11.4 billion that is being used to finance the one-off in reverse income tax credit ought to be diverted towards those, those earning a 
above the income tax threshold and by so doing increase the income tax threshold further. Madam Speaker, I, I, was, I was shocked to hear that. I was absolutely shocked to hear that. Madam Speaker, we are directing a benefit of $11.4 billion to persons who earn at the lower end of the income spectrum, including hundreds of thousands of hardworking Jamaicans who earn at minimum wage or just above minimum wage and who contribute to ed tax, NIS, and NHT. Are you suggesting taking away from yes, them and giving to higher income earners? Yes, Madam Speaker, when you increase income tax threshold, everyone above the threshold benefits. Those making 10 million, those making 20 million, those making 30 million. So the effect of, Mr. of the opposition leader's suggestion would be to take away the $20,000 reverse income tax credit from the hundreds of thousands of minimum wage earners and those just above who are among the 570,000 and give it to the 70,000 Jamaicans earning above 3 million. Madam Speaker, that is a red card. That is an approach, Madam Speaker, that we call champagne socialists. And that is what you get, Madam Speaker, from an unprincipled, cynical, flip-flop approach to policymaking. Not only would that suggestion be regressive, the opposite of progressive, it would also be fiscally questionable given that the source of funding for the one-off reverse income tax credit is non-recurring. Madam Speaker, in 2012, in 2012, Jamaica was in terrible fiscal shape and needed to raise a lot of revenue. And as I've said, Madam Speaker, the individuals, the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister, under tough circumstances, in my view, as individuals, did a great job. Yes. Okay? Great job, as individuals. What I doubt is the institutional capacity for that to be replicated when there are no guardrails, when there is choice. My Speaker, the Porsche Simpson Miller administration, because we were in, you know, levied a tax package on May 24th, 2012, to be effective June 1st, 2012, which was designed to raise $19 billion for the 2012-13 fiscal year, and which, when annualized on a 12-month basis, was a $23 billion tax package representing 1.8% of GDP at the time. Massive tax package. Included in that tax package was a broadening of the GCT base to include the application of GCT to raw foods, excluding chicken. There was some protest on aspects of the measure. On June 6, 2012, the then government tabled revised revenue measures that, among other changes, amended the application of GCT to raw foods by providing an exemption for domestic raw foods. You understand what happened? So what happened is the government needed to raise revenues in 2012. They came with a tax package, $23 billion annualized, 1.8% of the GDP, and included in that tax package was a broadening of the GCT net to include raw foods. There was some protest or representation, and the government in June of that year came back and revised it and took it off of, in other words, left the domestic as it was before. So prior to June of 2012, domestic raw foods and foreign raw foods were equally treated with respect to GCT. Neither category of goods affected, attracted GCT. Now we got into this position of a lopsided imbalance in the application of GCT on raw foods because of the need for revenue, not protection. Now, Madam Speaker, the imposition of GCT on foreign-produced raw foods, but not local-produced raw foods, 
violated binding trade agreements to which Jamaica is a party. It's not a, it's not a gray area. It is, it is black and white. Madam Speaker, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, GATT, is a multilateral, legally binding agreement that regulates trade among more than 153 countries in the world. By now it might be 160, I don't have the exact number. It was entered into 1947, and Jamaica became a contracting party of the GATT in Mar on March 9th of 1963. Jamaica's accession to the GATT was part of Jamaica's broader efforts to integrate into the global economy and foster economic development through trade. And the GATT was later replaced in 1995 by the WTO, of which Jamaica is also a member. Now, Madam Speaker, Article 3 of the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, which anybody can read on the internet. Article 3 of the General Agreement of, on Tariffs and Trade addresses national treatment of internal taxation regulation. It is very clear, Madam Speaker, that the agreement which is binding on Jamaica forbids the application of GCT on foreign produced goods in a specific category while not also applying GCT to locally produced goods in the same category. Here is an example, here is an excerpt of Article 3, Madam Speaker. And it's in my speech. I won't, I won't necessarily read it into the record here, but persons can, can look at it online. But it basically says the contracting parties recognize that internal taxes and other internal charges, laws, regulations, and requirements affecting the internal sale, offering for sale, purchase, transportation, distribution, or use of products, and internal quantitative regulations, dot, 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 should not be applied to imported domestic products so as to afford protection to domestic production. The products of the territory of any contracting party imported into the territory of any other contracting party shall not be subject directly or indirectly to internal taxes or other internal charges of any kind in excess of those applied directly or indirectly to like domestic products. Moreover, no contracting party shall otherwise apply internal taxes or other internal charges to imported or domestic products in a manner contrary to the principles set forth. Now, Madam Speaker, we didn't sign that, that agreement. We never wrote that law. But we have an obligation, when it is pointed out to us, to abide by international law. This is not debatable or up for negotiation. It is a crystally, it's a crystally clear provision. GCT is an internal tax. And it is against international trade law for it to be applied on foreign producers goods, but not to local goods of the same kind. The other side likes to talk about observing the law and about observing international law. How many times have we heard them talk about that? Huh? Observing international law. But Madam Speaker, again, these days they operate without principle, flip-flop, changing when the wind suits or when it seems politically expedient, Madam Speaker. This is another example of an unprincipled approach. And my speaker, the opposition leader asks, whose bidding am I doing? My speaker is out of order. I am upholding the rule of law and having Jamaica honor our international, legal, binding obligation. So Madam Speaker, Jamaica needed the revenue. Jamaica, use, if you listen, you will learn about this, okay? Madam Speaker, Jamaica needed the revenue in 2012, and so presumably, I'm not saying it is so, I mean, presumably, the decision was made on the basis of a, you know, kind of catch me if you can, right? In 2012. Well, Madam Speaker, Jamaica indeed was caught. First by CARICOM, by CARICOM. CARICOM got wind of this breach of international law and wrote to Jamaica demanding that changes be made so that its members were not subject to unfair trade practices. Madam Speaker, Jamaica quickly complied. Quickly complied. No, don't, okay. Trust me on this, okay? Jamaica quickly complied. 
and, in, and the Portia Simpson Miller administration changed the law in 2014 to ensure that foreign raw goods produced in CARICOM member states were exempt from GCT, Madam Speaker. That was in 2014. So they were caught by CARICOM. Fast forward, Madam Speaker, to 2023. Jamaica repre representatives of the World Trade Organization representatives of the World Trade Organization visited Jamaica in November of 2023 for a customary for a customary scheduled review of our trade regime and Madam Speaker they saw this breach and brought it to the attention of the current administration. Yeah. Madam Speaker, in the same way that when CARICOM pointed out the breach in 2014, GCT was promptly removed from imported raw foods originating in CARICOM. It is the same way that the WTO, having pointed it out, Madam Speaker, we are obligated to address it. And there are only two options to address this breach. Either we apply GCT to locally produce raw foods, or we remove it from imported raw foods. And we chose the more palatable option at this time because remo of removing GCT from raw foods. For good measure, Madam Speaker, I have no Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I have noted the suggestions about negotiations. I've noted the suggestions about negotiations. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, guys, Madam Speaker, you guys are wrong and strong on this. Strong and wrong. You are strong and wrong. Madam Speaker, this, this is a black and white issue that violates, violates a founding principle of, ja of GATT, Mr. Speaker, signed by 153 countries. It's not is not a negotiable provision. It is a, it's not a negotiable provision. The GCT is not a negotiable provision. I will talk about what is negotiable, but not the GCT. Okay? Now, I use the term blacklisted, Madam Speaker, as a term to mean sanctioned by the international community. There's no literal blacklist for breach of international money laundering or tax obligations. What I, what I meant, Madam Speaker, is that, and as I said, Jamaica would be exposed to trade sanctions from other WTO members. So, Madam Speaker, let's talk, let's talk about, let's talk about protection. Let's talk about protection and negotiation. Madam Speaker, the differential treatment in the application of GCT on raw foods. Hear me out. The differential treatment in the application of GCT on raw foods did not begin in 1991 and did not exist for 21 years after. There's no differential. They were treated on the same grounds. Right? It's only in the past 12 years where due to the need for revenues from a deep fiscal crisis that Jamaica ended up flouting international law with respect to the non-uniform application of GCT. Now, now, Madam Speaker, member states of the WTO have the opportunity to apply, like Jamaica, to apply duties and additional stamp duties, provided that the maximum duties that could be applicable are published in the WTO schedule. Okay, so how, how the WTO works, Madam Speaker, every country Mr. Speaker, every country has to submit the maximum duties that it can charge. And that was done for Jamaica some time ago. And the process of changing those maximum duties, Madam Speaker, is a, Mr. Speaker, a negotiation that is very, very, very expensive and can take a very long time. Currently, Jamaica applies import duties and additional stamp duties on imported raw foods. For example, for tomatoes, for cabbage, and for carrots, raw foods that we produce in Jamaica, 
import duty is 100%. An additional stamp duty is 80%. And these are compounded. And that results in an effective total duty rate of 260% for tomatoes, for cabbage, and for carrots. Now, Madam Speaker, as part of Jamaica's WTO agreements, Jamaica has committed to maximum levels of duties of 100% and maximum levels of duties of other duties, i.e. additional stamp duty of 80% to be charged on selected imports. And that is a public schedule that all the countries of the world have. Okay? All the countries have what we have put down as our maximum. We never put it down, not this administration. It was agreed on our collective behalf in the past. Now, Madam Speaker, unlike internal taxes such as GCT, as I mentioned, these maximum inbound rates are negotiable. But we must bear in mind, and I will circle it for full public uh, consumption and understanding, the process that of renegotiation. And you'll see the flow chart. And I'll share with you documentation that you see how complicated a process it is and how long it takes. And in addition, Article, third, Article 23 of GATT, there's an article that speaks about how you modify the schedule. Okay? And what we aim to do is to increase public understanding. Not to, right? There's Article 23 of the GATT schedule. And it reminds us, and I'm going to, in quotes from Article 3, it says, in such negotiations and agreement, meaning negotiations, which may include provisions for compensatory adjustments with respect to other products, the contracting parties concerned shall endeavor to maintain a general level of reciprocal and mutually advantageous concessions not less favorable to trade than provided for in this agreement prior to such negotiations. And what that means, Madam Speaker, is that any favorable adjustment in maximum rates in one area would need to be traded with compensating adjustments elsewhere. So, Madam Speaker, we, we Madam Speaker, the government, Madam Speaker, has the option of additional stamp duties and other duties because we are not at the maximum level for all of the products. And the government of Jamaica is committed to quickly reviewing the additional stamp duty regime, including for raw foods, with a view of making the necessary adjustments in consultation with stakeholders. We are putting together a working group in this regard. The amendment for the GCT has not been passed yet. Okay? We are putting together, Madam Speaker, a working group in this regard, which includes the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, and the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, inclusive of the Jamaica Customs Agency. Each of the parties to the working group will engage stakeholders in their sector. For the Ministry of Agriculture, this will include the Jamaica Agricultural Society, I believe, Minister Green, it will also include maybe even RADA and other stakeholders in, ag in the agriculture sector. The third schedule to the GCT schedule, I must remind everyone, Madam Speaker, allows, shows all the items exempted. This is a, Madam Speaker, this is a very important part, point because there are some that will take advantage of the public not understanding what is happening. There's a view that when we say raw food stuff, we mean everything conceivable that constitutes raw food. That's not the case. Okay, the, the third schedule of the GCT Act shows all the items, hear me out first, shows all the items, Madam Speaker, that have been exempted from GCT from the very beginning, meaning even when the net was broadened, these items were not included. As a result, these items do, did not attract GCT on imports and did not attract GCT locally. So these items, Madam Speaker, 
in the, the, the measure announced today does not affect in any way items on this schedule, which include fresh fruit and vegetables, excluding imported apples, pears, apricots, cherries, peaches, nectarines, plums, berries, grapes, and kiwis, ground provisions, legumes, onions and garlic, meat, chicken, fish, crustacean or mollusk, corn, my speaker. So just let me be very clear that since these items were exempted from GCT, there was and is no differential in the regime. And so it follows, Madam Speaker, that for these, G sorry, I said it out the wrong way around. It follows, Madam Speaker, that for these, GCT will continue to apply. So let me say it again. When the net was broadened, Madam Speaker, and, the, some, and, and GCT was then taken off of some, this third schedule, Madam Speaker, represented, represents the items that were exempted from that treatment. So our, the amendment to be passed at some point in 24-25, Madam Speaker, will not have an effect on these items. The way they are treated it will not change. So Madam Speaker, with respect to the other items that are not on this list, Madam Speaker, with respect to the other, for these items, for these items, Madam Speaker, they are being treated, GCT, the GCT treatment for these items is the same on local and foreign. And that is why, Madam Speaker, and they were exempt, because they were exempt from the beginning. Okay? No, no, you're, you are totally confused, Member, with the greatest of respect. Totally confused. No, you are totally confused. My speaker, as I mentioned, we, are, we have announced the intention to uphold international law, Madam Speaker, but we, at some point in this fiscal year, we'll bring an amendment, but we can choose the time that the amendment is brought. And as I mentioned, Madam Speaker, we will have a committee, a multi-stakeholder committee, Madam Speaker, to look at the additional stamp duty regime, my speaker, to make the best decisions going forward, taking into account multiple uh, points of view. Madam Speaker, just some inaccurate claims that the opposition spokesperson on finance made the comment, path funds have not kept up with inflation. That's not correct, Madam Speaker. That's not correct. Allocations to PATH in the upcoming fiscal year have increased by almost 30% or $2 billion, which is four times the rate of inflation over the past 12 months. Since 2016, since 2016, since 2016, the average, since 2016, the average real rate of increase in PATH allocations adjusted for inflation is approximately 15%. So the My speaker. Path, no. Path, I'm saying path allocations, Madam Speaker. Path allocations have increased by 30% in the last 12 months and since 2016 have increased at a rate, Madam Speaker, way above the rate of inflation. And I believe the number is 15% above the rate of inflation. Madam Speaker, the opposition leader, Mr. Speaker, the opposition leader also erroneously claimed, and I read in quotes, there has been upward movement in poverty, both poverty and inequality under, this, under the JLP government. The prevalence of poverty increased from 16.7% to 11% in 2019. Madam Speaker, this is, it is inaccurate. And it is beneath the leader of the opposition to mislead in this way. He knows that the rate of 16.7% is for 2021, three years ago. Yet he speaks of it as if it is a current figure. He doesn't even put the date for it. He puts a date for the 11%, but you notice the date for the 167 is not there. Madam well, Speaker, he knows that the Jamaica Labour Party administration began in February 2016 
and he knows that in 2015 under the PNP, the incidence of poverty was 21.2%. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the incidence of poverty in Jamaica, even in the midst of the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I've, I've listened to the torrent of, of what he's had to say. But on this particular point, I was quoting from the most recent Jamaica su survey of living conditions. I was quoting from that, which is a government publication. So, red card, red card. He may be quoting from a survey of living conditions, but he knows that the rate is for 2021. It's in the public domain. And, but, so, my speaker, and more than that, he knows that the rate of poverty for 2015 under their government was 21.2%. Now, if you start at 21.2%, and even after COVID, you're at 16.7%, how can you stand and tell the people of Jamaica that poverty has increased? My Speaker, red card, red card. Misleading the house, misleading the house, misleading the house. Madam Speaker, for the record, for the record, poverty in Jamaica has fallen under the Jamaica Labour Party administration to 2021. That, that, that is just a basic fact, Madam Speaker. It was 21.2, and in 2021, it was 16.7%. And Madam Speaker, In its quarterly report for August 2023, for those who are paying attention, the PIOJ reported that they are projecting a fall even from 16.7 percent. Madam Speaker, and furthermore, in October 2023, the World Bank released their estimate of poverty for 2022. I don't know if they'll be correct or not, but it's way lower than 16.7. So don't go around, my, there's enough to talk about. You don't have to make things up, right? Of 16 talking about poverty is increased under this administration. It is just not true. And for misleading the Jamaican people, man, speaker, it is a red card. Red card. Red card. We cannot tolerate this coming from an opposition leader, man, speaker. It is not right. It is not right, Madam Speaker. It is not right. And I wish I never had to stand here and point it out. You have no use. You have no use. You have no I hope it's not intentional. Madam Speaker, the, the, there's another kind of false claim. Here's what was claimed in the opposition leader's presentation. The government has been boasting of low unemployment when most of those jobs are below the International Labour Organization standard of decent work. Madam Speaker, he's just taking anecdotes and just stating them as fact, not looking at any documentation whatsoever to substantiate the views. There is actually a Caribbean Policy Research 2023 report, and it's called Growthless Jobs. That's the name of it. Yeah? I don't, I mean, it's not, more, it's not a favorable title, right? But that's what it's called. And in that report, produced by scholars who are doing research and studying, here's what it says, and permit me to read what it says. It says, employment data from the labor force surveys between 2015 and 2022 shows that most of the newly created jobs have been full-time jobs. In Jamaica, and, and we know that, you know, the BPO, alone has expanded massively. Tourism has expanded massively. Those are full-time jobs. In Jamaica, and I'm continuing to quote, my interve intervention there is not a part of the text. Let me start again. Employment data from the labor force surveys between 2015 and 2022 shows that most of the newly created jobs have been full-time jobs. In Jamaica, 
the number of employees working more than 35 hours has risen, has risen substantially alongside a simultaneous but less dramatic fall in those working fewer than 35 hours, indicating a shift towards full-time jobs. The rise of formal work is displayed by the occupation composition of employment growth. Two of the strongest occupational growth categories were clerks, accounting for 24% of the new jobs, and professionals, senior officials, and technicians, which added 21%. Combined growth in these two categories represents half of the growth across occupations and 84% of those were formal workers. The rise in formal employment has been fueled by increased employment of educated workers. Just 23% of unskilled workers in Jamaica work in the formal economy compared to 69% of semi-skilled and 91% of skilled workers. And it goes on. And I have the rest of it in my speech. So, but the, the essence of it, Madam Speaker, just contradicts the claim that he's making, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I just want to make one other. Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Jesus, please. Mr. Speaker, the the opposition, and uh, you know, this is this, this is not 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 a, a major point, but it's one that has to point out, Madam Speaker, because this creep, the opposition spokesman for finance stated that, furthermore. We initiated reforms to grant the Bank of Jamaica operational independence in setting monetary policy, primarily focused on inflation targeting to ensure price stability. Yeah. As we go, in, in this country, we like to grab ideas and think we can own them. And ideas are a dime a dozen and in the context of countries and policies I mentioned earlier. And therefore, there's sometimes a, certainly a confusion coming from opposition sides between ideas and talk and action, on the other hand, achievement and results. I know by experience that the idea of operational independence of the central bank predates even the Simpson Miller administration and dates back to the 2010 IMF program. I know that because I was on the BOJ board in 2009 and 2010. It is an idea I found very attractive at the time. And I must tell you, it is one of the ideas, one of my, and, and I was inspired by the discussion that ensued. However, Madam Speaker, Jamaica was grappling with suffocating fiscal dominance and unsustainable fiscal arrangements. And it, you know, though it was an idea and there's work done on it and stuff brought to the board, yeah, that I was a part of, it could not, there's no way it could be done at that time. But as tangible, as tangible evidence, Madam Speaker, in 2009, former Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Don Weddy, proposed that the BOJ set up a monetary policy committee to determine interest rates. Yeah, you see that article there? That's 2009. Don Webby, restructure BOJ. Webby proposes new central bank model, proposes uh, committee, right? And he wouldn't have been the first. So these ideas existed from then and indeed were being pursued, but in reality they could not be achieved. Now, Madam Speaker, Anyone can review the extended fund facility agreements and all 10 reviews under the 2012 to 2015 administration. None of the many structural benchmarks in those documents address monetary policy operations of the central bank, nor modernization of the central bank. None of them. During this period, the government's economic policy framework was set out in those documents, and particularly in the structural and quantitative targets. Madam Speaker, in my capacity as Ambassador of Economic Affairs, with the support of the Prime Minister, 
I negotiated the precautionary standby arrangement with the IMF in 2016 and the structural benchmarks under the precautionary standby arrangement. And on those benchmarks represent the first time that, mo that monetary policy operations or modernization of the central bank is listed as an agreed policy objective. And the sixth structural benchmark reads to enhance the BOJ. And I don't, you can read it for yourself. No. There is no structural benchmark on the monetary policy operations. Trust me on it, opposition leader. Okay? Trust me on it. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, to get there required technical assistance, a technical assistance mission from the IMF consisted of monetary policy experts who visited Jamaica, met with officials, and delivered their report in 2017, and that formed the basis of more than one cabinet submission, and even, even in advance of the law coming into effect, Jamaica began its transition to full-fledged inflation targeting. Inflation targeting, Madam Speaker, is not a secret. I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's not a secret. And so when you say began the transition, inflation target is not a secret. It's a very public thing. Because if it's not public, it cannot be achieved. It's a public structure. It requires publicly setting inflation targets and updating the public about progress towards deviation from those targets. It requires, as a prerequisite, and here is the part, a transparent competitive mechanism for the central bank to engage with the foreign exchange market in purchases and sales of foreign exchange. You can't have inflation targeting without a transparent competitive mechanism. And this prerequisite for inflation targeting, Madam Speaker, and that prerequisite, Mr. Speaker, was only achieved in 2017 with the launch of the Bank of Jamaica's foreign exchange intervention trading tool, Be Fix It, which is a rules-based competitive multiple price FX tool that improve the bank's interaction with authorized, de authorized dealers and cambios for the buying and selling of foreign exchange. With BFixit in place, the Bank of Jamaica officially began its transition to full-fledged inflation targeting in 2017, and that was a public thing. The central bank governor gave a speech at a quarterly press briefing entitled Modernizing Jamaica's Foreign Exchange Market, the pivot to inflation targeting the pivot to inflation targeting in November of 2017. And, and, he, and, and he, in that speech, Madam Speaker, he noted the milestone of the first time that a Minister of Finance and the Public Service set in a medium-term target of 4 to 6%. That is when inflation targeting was done in Jamaica. Yeah. Madam Speaker, there were things done between 12, 2012 and 2016. What I'm saying is, the statement, Madam Speaker, made uh, as it is made, the words used are inaccurate, Madam Speaker. The words used. What we need. I just, I, you know your speech. No. Read what you said. Read what you said. So, Madam Speaker. and nothing to do with monetary policy operations, okay? So you can talk about that, talk about what you passed, but you didn't do anything with monetary policy operations, that's a fact. Now, Madam Speaker, in last year's budget presentation, Mr. Speaker, I'm not looking at him when I'm speaking, it's in my speech, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I apologize. Madam Speaker, in, in last year's budget presentation, I spent, I spent a considerable amount of time speaking about the need to transition from contract employment to permanent employment. Madam Speaker, this is a problem that has been around for 20 years or longer, maybe 30 years, where people are employed temporarily, have no security of tenure, can't get a mortgage, and can't live normal lives, don't have pension on their retirement. This has been the reality in Jamaica yes. long before this administration, for at least, at least 20 years before this administration, if not more. And the policy position of this government is that we are determined over a period of time, and last year I gave three years, right, over a three-year period to address this problem. My speaker, we, the process, though, of addressing the problem is 
challenging and long. There's a lot of paperwork that has to be done, which I won't get into. But I am pleased, Madam Speaker, to update this House that with respect to the National Solid Waste Management Authority and its four regional companies, the Cabinet has given the approval for 3,813 new ports to be created. And that is across the National Solid Waste Management Authority, MPM Waste Management Authority, NEMPM Waste Management, SPM Waste Management, and WPM Waste Management Authority. Madam Speaker, at the moment, there are only 269 posts. Everybody else is on contract. Sanitation workers, truck drivers, route supervisors, enforcement officers, mechanics, Madam Speaker, all of the working people in NSWMA and its subsidiaries for the past 30 years approximately, Madam Speaker, we're, we're actors, as the Minister is saying, on contract. But under this government, Madam Speaker, the permanent post has been created. And in the upcoming fiscal year, we will make workers in the NSWMA and their subsidiaries permanent. Time come for permanent employment, Madam Speaker. Excellent. So, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have Mr. Speaker, there is a, 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 just a slight change to the provision on importation of armored cars for the security industry. Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in a, where Mr. Speaker, which we, are, which we are tabling here today. I don't have it on me. But Mr. Speaker, this is a significant budget. Coming nine, this is the ninth budget of this administration, Mr. Speaker. And this is the seventh consecutive year of absolutely no new tax. And my, Mr. Speaker, we have demonstrated that we are a government that believes in economic freedom, yes. and we are also a government that believes in social justice. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister announced a groundbreaking measure that will have a tremendous impact on inequality in Jamaica with the creation of the Jamaica 60 trust funds that he announced, Mr. Speaker. And he'll have more to say about that in time. He raised the minimum wage from 13,000 to 15,000, Mr. Speaker. and provided a raft of benefits for persons in seeking housing. Importantly, which has not been carried sufficiently in the media, yes. he announced that the work will begin this year for regularization of a number of informal communities across the country with a $15 billion program that will begin on the capital side of the budget next year. Yes. Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, we are implementing 
for the first time a reverse income tax credit, which will apply $20,000 to all Jamaicans earning before, below $3 million who contribute to the Jamaican system. We will be increasing the pension exemption and the age exemption such that pensioners who are over the age of 65 and who earn more than the current income tax threshold of 1.5 million will have the opportunity for $135,000 more on their pension. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we are increasing the income tax threshold from 1.5 million to 1.7 million at a cost of $9 billion. We are removing, finally, Mr. Speaker, the need for a student loan in accessing tertiary financing from the Student Loan Bureau. A regressive measure has been in place for 30 years, introduced, abolished, Mr. Speaker, by this government. We are increasing the de minimis threshold on importation, doubling it from 50 US dollars to 100 US dollars. We're doubling the passenger duty threshold, Mr. Speaker, from 500 US dollars to 1,000 US dollars. We are constructing at the same time four hospitals across Jamaica. We have $20 billion allocated to roads, building highways, procuring 100 new buses and 50 garbage trucks all at the same time. Mr. Speaker, this is a government unlike others from the other side that we've had before that pursues economic stability and then turns around and leverages that economic stability in the interest of the Jamaican people. And we are disposed, predisposed to an environment that is predictable and not one that is chaka chaka with taxes every year. And most importantly, Madam Speaker, we don't have to rely on tactics that earn red cards with producing charts that don't include relevant years, don't include the fact that there's a COVID crisis, don't include the revenue, Mr. Speaker. We don't produce that. Red card for them, Mr. Red Speaker. Card. Red card. So, Mr. Speaker, it is it was with that, Mr. Speaker, of presenting a budget that pushes them into the corner and forces them to make those kind of flip-flop unprincipled mistakes, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a gov this is a government that in the pursuit of economic freedom and social justice improves the standard of living of the Jamaican people with per capita income rising even as we strengthen the social safety net. We introduced a social pension, Mr. Speaker. We introduced a tourism workers' pension scheme, and we will introduce the unemployment insurance. And Mr. Speaker, with that, Mr. Speaker, I conclude the closing presentation to the budget debate for 2024-25. Ask, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the bill be read a second time. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Clark. A bill entitled an act to apply a sum out of the consolidated fund 
to the service of the year ending on the 31st day of March 2025 and to appropriate the sums granted in this session of Parliament for a second time. Thanks. Minister? Minister? The House, the House will now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill, clause by clause. Minister, how would you like to proceed? Madam Speaker, if there are no, if there are no objections, Madam Speaker, no, I ask for the... The whole bill is before. Um, chairman of the committee, I ask that the whole bill be put to the House, Mr. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Members... Members, I put clauses one through to clause three. Those in favor? Aye. I put schedules two and three. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. I put the title and enacting clause. Those in favor? Aye. The question is that I do report the bill as having passed committee stage without amendments. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Ms. Madam. No, not as yet, Minister. One minute. <laughs> I do report the bill as having passed committee stage without amendments. Minister? Madam Speaker, I now ask that the bill be read a third time. Madam Clark? <laughs> Members, the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill entitled an act to apply a sum out of the consolidated fund to the service of the year ending on the 31st day of March 2025 and to appropriate the sums granted in this session of Parliament read a third time and passed. Yeah. House Leader? Yes. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I beg to move for the recommittal of two items, items announcements and item notices of motions given orally in order for the admin, amendment to the ministry paper number 11 and 12 to be tabled and also for me to take a motion with regards to an amendment to the membership of the Economic and Production Commission. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Members, the question is that we recommit announcements and notices, notices of motions given orally. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Announcements? Also laid on the table of the House today are copies of the amendment to the ministry paper number 11 of 2024 entitled Revenue Measures for the Financial Year 2024-2025. House Leader. Madam Speaker, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move. Be it resolved, with reference to the resolution approved by this Honorable House on the 29th day of September 2020, appointing an Economic and Production Committee that the name Mr. Hugh Graham be deleted and the name Mr. Fitz Jackson be substituted thereto. And Madam Speaker, I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take this motion. Public business, House Leader. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion, notice of which I gave earlier. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House Leader. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the motion be approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House Leader. Madam Speaker, it is not intended to do any further business today. 
But on the motion of adjournment, Madam Speaker, I'd like to just indicate to members that we are at the verge of the observation of perhaps the most holy period in Christendom. And for those of us in Jamaica who have subscribed to the Christian faith, this is a particularly holy period. And as this honorable house uh, breaks its session in conclusion of the uh, financial debate, we just want to use the opportunity to uh, wish members a very peaceful and holy Easter and that indeed they will uh, be rested and refreshed and do the wonderful family things that make for the strength of this society over the years. Madam Speaker, we will be uh, taking a short break as is customary, uh, the Easter break, and we'll come back to this honorable house um, later to uh, recommence the sittings of the house at which time we will begin the sectoral debates. And um, we're hoping to have a vigorous debating session as per usual, as the ministers will outline the plans and programs in terms of the appropriations budget, which we have just passed in this honorable house. Um, Madam Speaker, I therefore beg to move that this honorable house be adjourned for a date to be fixed. The question is that the house do now adjourn for a date to be fixed. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. This honorable house now stands adjourned. Scene TV has just presented the sitting of the House of Parliament live from Gordon House. Hi everyone watching at home. We're here to remind you that if you or someone you know were injured in an accident that was not your fault, listen up. We have live agents available right now to answer your questions and tell you how much your case is potentially worth. Hi, I'm Gina Belich here with spokesman and TV personality Tom Mustin with us in the Help Center. So Tom, phones are really busy over there. Tell us what kind of calls you're seeing. Well, Gina, first off, thank you for having me here in the call center with you. We always enjoy talking to the viewers and getting folks the compensation that they deserve. You know, we're seeing calls about all kinds of accidents, but the most common by far has been car accidents. So if you or someone you know were injured in an accident that was not your fault, give us a call right now. You'll speak with a live person. They'll answer any questions you have and tell you if you have a case and how much your case is potentially worth. Thanks, Tom. All right, folks at home, you heard it. Take advantage of this opportunity and call now. Hey, everyone, Emeril Lagasse here, and I'm so excited to tell you about my biggest air fryer yet. Introducing Emeril Lagasse's Dual Zone Air Fryer Oven with dual-sided cooking chambers. Now you can cook two different foods two different ways that finish at the same time. Enjoy juicy grilled burgers at the same time as air-fried french fries, broiled savory salmon at the same time as roasted asparagus. The secret is in the quick sync technology that matches the cooking times and settings of each food, so they're programmed to finish at the same time. But watch, remove the center divider and it transforms into a large 25 quart capacity oven. Now you can try Emeril Lagasse's Dual Zone Air Fryer Oven with free recipe book in your home for 30 days for just $14.99. But wait, we'll automatically upgrade you to his deluxe cooking kit and one year VIP protection plan absolutely free. Complete with everything you need to cook Monday to Sunday family size meals. Plus, ask how you can get free shipping. This offer will not last, so order now. You're going to love it. I guarantee it. Okay, I'm Bunga Herman, master drummer, singer, and percussion player for CTV. Big up yourself. When you look with. Don't change your dial. Better get ready, come do rock steady. You've got to do it like CTV. You've got to do it just like CTV.
Okay, talking football now on the Sports Max Zone. And after a four month wait, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Football Federation finally has a new president. This following Otashi Spring topping an unprecedented four other contenders to secure a four year term. Spring secured 19 votes. Best thing Wayne Grant, who had 15, Marvin Fraser with 12, outgoing president Carl Dixon with four, and Renton Haynes with two. First vice president goes the way of Dominic Stoll, while second vice president will be Josiah Descent, who tied on votes with Roxel John. However, John withdrew from the run-in. Third vice president will be Dwight Roberts, and the committee members will be Kolzak, Dwight Batiste, Yolan London and Koyana Horn. Well, the man who will be leading these executives and federation on a whole joins us this afternoon. Otashi, welcome to the Sportsmax Zone. So happy we could finally get this interview with you. Well, um, let me say uh, thank you for inviting me um, to your your show and let me say a pleasant evening as well to the viewers of Sportbox. Congratulations again and of course I'll start by asking you how did you feel when you saw the results the the mile that you won by? <laughs> well um, um, to be honest we have been doing a lot of a lot of work um, during the campaign and we have been keep in touch with our polls and so forth um, and we knew exactly where we were and we knew what we, what is it that we needed to do um so i wasn't like too surprised uh, as to what the results um were on the night um it would just it would just have made um the fact that we were basically hoping to to at least win by a much bigger margin because of the kind of a work that we would have done yeah, and what was the basis of your campaign? Because unfortunately, we didn't get to chat with you leading up to the elections. So I'd love to know, you know, what were you saying to the delegates? Well, um, I basically just um, presented um, our project, um, that being the progress we need. Um, it's, a, it's a project that, in my view, would have assessed the current state of affairs of um, football in our country and would have offered the most ideal, um, comprehensive, uh, real, and affordable um, um, plans, policies, um, events, agenda, um, objectives, goals, I mean, to basically bring about the transformation and the changes that that we all know that we need here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Right. I'm where football is ever concerned. Yeah. I'm going to start to ask you to tell me a bit about those plans, because you are the president now. It's no yes. more campaigning. It's down to work and, you know, it's business time. People, of course, expect you to deliver. What's some of the short-term projects that you're going to start working on or you have already started working on? Um, well, um, in terms of um, what we already started doing is um, we, we're basically uh, dealing with housekeeping work um, to the transition period, ensuring that everything is in place for us to keep, um, well, to